If you want to get your Bible out um, with you, you can use electronic Bible. There's actually one in front of you today, so that's cool. Um, the one in front of you would be page number 1367, 1367. And um, if you, uh, the phone came up today a couple times, so uh, if you can be self-disciplined to use your phone and, you know, not all of a sudden, beep, 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 something goes off on Snapchat or on Instagram or on Facebook. And, you, you know, if you can stay on the Word, do that. If not, you probably should put it down and go ahead and get, take up this old hard copy of paper. Uh, because the text that we have today is a little bit, um, it's, it can be difficult. It can be a difficult text. It, it can be tough to walk through it. So we're going to walk through it, but I'm just letting you know at the very get-go that you're going to have to turn up the listening ears a little bit because it's, it, it's, it's a little difficult text, but it's so powerful if you just hang on. So let me just start it this way. I was, have you ever um, been somewhere where it seemed like you were welcomed? You know, they're like, hey, great to see you, great to have you. But then as time came on, it wasn't very welcoming. And there's a difference. So you can go somewhere and you can be welcomed. Hey, I'm glad that you're here, but it doesn't take long for things to happen and you really feel like, okay, I was welcomed, but people are no longer welcoming me as to be a part of their life. Life, life just moved on and I went in this corner. And, I, and so I thought about that as, as it relates to my relationship with God. There are times in my life, and more often than I wish there were, where I feel like I welcome God. He's welcomed into my life. He's welcomed in this situation. But then when other things come up, I'm no longer welcoming him to enter lordship over me. So there's times I'm like, God, I welcome you. Like, I have to speak a message on Sunday morning that's supposed to be straight from you and, and like, like people need to be encouraged. And God, I welcome you. Like I need you to, to give me something that you're saying. And so like, like those, that's a welcome moment. But then there's other times in my life where like all of a sudden God's leadership or relationship in my life is no longer welcoming. Now I'm like, okay, God, you did that. Now I have to go do this or I've got to get the garage cleaned. Or, and all of a sudden it's not welcoming. So we're going to talk about that uh, today, the difference between welcomed but not welcoming. Uh, and in John chapter 4, verse 43, Jesus addresses this, this whole issue, but he, he sets us up. I love, I love how Christ does this. If you read the Gospels and you really, like, don't read them quick, but you just take a moment, like, you find that Jesus sets people up all the time. And, and in today's passage, he's going to set... He's going to set you up, and you should be irritated, but it's on point. So let me help irritate you for just a moment. So let's go ahead. I'm going to read part of it, and then we'll come back and kind of break it apart after I read through it. John chapter 4, verse 43. After two days, referring to Jesus, he left the Galilee, left for Galilee, rather, and then in the NIV, it has this parenthesis. Now Jesus Himself had pointed out that a prophet was no long, uh, not an, uh, was, has no honor in his home country. When he arrived in Galilee, the Galileans welcomed him. They had seen all that he had done in Jerusalem at the Passover feast, for they also had been there. That almost seems to be like a separate occasion. Jesus was in Samaria. New thought. Jesus is going to Galilee. And it almost seems as if there's another thought happening. Once more he visited Cana and Galilee where he had turned water into wine. And there was a certain royal official whose son lay sick in Capernaum. When this man heard that Jesus had arrived in Galilee from Judea, he went, he went to him and begged him to come and heal his son who was close to death. And then Jesus says this thing that should rub you. It should kind of cause stress for a moment. He's got a son that's dying, and Jesus says, unless you people see signs and wonders, you will never believe. 
The royal official said, Sir, come down before my child dies. Go, Jesus replied, your son will live. So what in the world is going on? Is it, is it three scattered ideas? Is it three different things that are, that are happening? Is it, is it obscure? Like what, what's happening? So let's, let's just kind of, instead of scratching our head, let's just take a moment and walk through it. So the first thing is the NIV actually says, in, in kind of a weird way, it says, after the two days he left for Galilee, and then it has this parentheses. Now, Jesus himself had pointed out that a prophet has no honor in his own country. So it looks as if Jesus is just going to go to Galilee. Oh, and by the way, as he's going to Galilee, he just wants everyone to know that, hey, sometimes or most places a prophet isn't welcome. That's what it looks like in NIV. And I'm not anti-NIV today, just so you know, I use it all the time. But there's sometimes when, I'm, when we have to come through and they, and they take the Greek and they have to say, okay, what does this mean today? And how do we, how do we put it into everyday English? Uh, there's some things that I think are missed. Um, and this is one that, I, that you'll see right along uh, with me. So, um, John chapter 31 says the reasons why the Gospel of John was written. It says that you might believe Jesus is the Son of God. So, I want to suggest to you there's actually a reason why Jesus leaves Samaria after two days of great ministry and goes to Galilee. The Greek actually picks it up in a really great way, and the American Standard Version shows it. So here it is. American Standard Version says, after the two days, he went forth from thence. That's why I don't use it, right? Forth from thence. Say that 10 times in a row. He went forth from thence into Galilee. Here's this word. For Jesus himself testified that a prophet has no honor in his own country. In other words, John is saying this, the reason that Jesus left Samaria and went to Galilee is because a prophet is not welcome in his own country. Jesus has an intentionality of what he's trying to accomplish in Galilee. Are you with me? In other words, Jesus is intentionally saying, hey, I'm going back there because they're not accepting me as Savior and Messiah. We just sang a song about Jesus going after the one. Here, Jesus just had a flourishing time in Samaria. He leaves it to go after those that are not receiving him. And so the rest of this chapter deals with this whole welcoming versus welcome. Have you, have you ever come to Jesus where, like, you wanted something from him because of who he was without really wanting to know him? I think this is what's happening in Galilee. In essence, they were saying, hey, um, we, we, we have the next verse. Would you just go to the next verse? And, and, and so, when he arrived in Galilee, the Galileans welcomed him. They had seen all that he had done in Jerusalem at the Passover feast, for they had also been there. This is, so this is interesting to me. Because on one hand, it just said that a prophet is not welcomed, a prophet is not honored in his own country, and then Jesus gets to Galilee, and it says that they what? They welcomed him. Does anybody else feel like what just happened? <laughs> and, 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 and so I want to suggest to you, like, what, what, what's happening is they saw what Jesus did in the temple. Like, remember Jesus went into the temple on, 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 on the Passover day, and he walks in, and he had, like, the whips, and he drives at all the animals that they were, you know, giving the really high price for, and he, and he goes in, and he starts flipping over tables, and he says what? I will not let my house become a house of thieves, right? I won't be a house of prayer. And so he's like, this isn't going to happen. So like the text says they were all there and they saw it. They also certainly heard about Jesus turning water into wine. So what they're saying is like, Jesus, he's our boy. <laughs> like he's our man. Like, 
Jesus, like the guy that went to Jerusalem and he flipped stuff over and he's like, my house will not be a house you know, of thieves. It's a house of prayer, whatever. Like, that's my guy. Jesus was at the party for the wedding and he, and he takes some water and, and he turns it into wine. That, that's my guy. Like, do you get it? There's a, welcome that, there's a welcome that we can do as it relates to God, almost as saying he's my hero, he's my provider, he's my source of peace, like he's my boy, but as believers, we can go there with, and still miss the fact as Lord. I don't, I don't know if this makes sense at all. Jesus is saying, listen, I'm going to Galilee. They welcome me for what I can do, but they don't accept me for who I am. They welcome me for what I can do for them, but they will not accept me for who I am. And I don't think it's a far stretch from where the church is today. I think we can often come to Christ welcoming him for what he can do for us. God, give me peace. Give me hope. God, heal my marriage. God, like, heal my body. God, give me money. God, give me sense of mental health. God, God, give me a good family. God, give me a spouse. Like, God, give me, do for me, help me. And we can have all these things, even in a church world, and still miss out on the fact that he's like, God, I just want to worship you. I just want you to be the Lord of my life. I just want to spend time with you because of who you are, not for what you can do for me. And what Jesus does is he's going to set them all up. He's going to set them up. So the next verse, John chapter 4, verse 46, says, once more he visited Cana in Galilee, this is the NIV, where he had turned water into wine. There was a certain royal official whose son lay in Capernaum. And so again, it feels like it's unrelated. So Jesus just said, hey, uh, you know, prophet isn't accepted, but they accepted him. Okay, so now he's going to go to Capernaum. Like, what just happened? Again, there's a word missing. It's imperative to really understanding what's happening. So in the Greek, there's the word therefore. It's shown in the American Standard Version. So it says that he came therefore again in the king of Galilee. In other words... What's it there for? It's there for because Jesus just left Samaria. He went to the Galilee because he knew he wasn't going to be accepted because they didn't see him as Lord and Savior. They only saw him as the town hero. Therefore, he's going to do something to upset the crowd again. Therefore, he goes to Cana because something's going to happen that all of us are going to go, what just happened? That's a mouthful. Let me just paraphrase what I think is going on. So Jesus leaves Samaria intentionally going to Galilee because he is not honored there because they see him simply as a town hero who does, not, who does signs and wonders. Jesus is going to travel to a place where the first sign happened. Jesus goes to Cana, meets up with a royal official, king of Herod. Here Jesus will teach us all about the kind of faith he's looking for and what it really means to be a follower of Christ. So let, let's just continue this path on John chapter 4, verse 46. And there was a certain royal official whose son lay sick at Capernaum. When this man heard that Jesus, you can go to the next verse if you would. Uh, there you go. When this man heard that Jesus had arrived in Galilee from Judea, he went to him and begged him to come and heal his son who was close to death. Jesus says, unless you people see miraculous signs and wonders, you will never believe. Does this sound harsh to anybody? Just, come on, look, like we've read the text a hundred times, you're like, yeah, 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 yeah. But just, come on, like as if this was your first time. If, if this was your son that's dying. Jesus is there, and all the people are watching, saying, what's going to happen? What's Jesus going to do? Is he going to turn water into wine? Like, what's going on? They're all watching. They want to see the signs and wonders. This is so great. Somebody comes to Jesus who's an official of King Herod. They don't like him. This is like Samaria. Remember Samarians? They despise. Why was Jesus in Samaria for like two days? Why did he talk to a lady? Why did he give salvation? They're Samaritans. 
Same thing's happening, different day, different story, but same thing. Jesus is now gonna deal with the King Herod's official, someone despised. King Herod's official walks up and says, Jesus, I've just traveled for 20 miles. My son is dying. Would you come and heal him? Jesus says, unless you people, unless you see signs and wonders, you will never believe. It's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's, it's a statement of uh, um, conviction. It's a statement saying, hey, you're missing it. You're misunderstanding. It's a statement saying, you should be shocked. You should take a moment and, and, and say, man, like, what am I doing as a follower of Christ? Like, why am I following him? Like, it's the shocking moment there. Do you feel shocked for a moment? Because you're supposed to. You're, you're supposed to feel like this just doesn't sound right. It's supposed to take a moment where we just stop and think. Like, am I only interested in what Jesus can do for me? Am I, is that why I'm here? Am I only here because I grew up in America in a Christian country? Am I only here because my parents started coming to like the Lord in church and so I'm here? Like, why am I here? If I was in an Islamic country, would I be a Muslim? If I was in a Hindu country, would I be Hindu? If I was in a Buddhist country, like, why am, why am I here? Like, that should be the question that we're asking ourselves. Why, like, why, what am I doing? Why am I seeking God? Why, why am I following him? Why? Why do I call myself a Christian in the first place? And, and, and I, I, I just, I, I want to ask that of myself and I want to ask that of you. Jesus says, hey, unless you see signs and wonders, you won't believe. That's a rebuke. That's not a license. It's a rebuke. Matthew 16.4 says clearly a wicked, adulterous generation. They seek after the sign, the wonder. They seek after what they can get. A wicked, adulterous generation is all about what can I get out of Jesus? What can Jesus do for me? How can Jesus make my life better? How can Jesus give me more peace? How can Jesus provide for me? How can Jesus give me like mental health? Like, like so a wicked, adulterous generation just simply says, Jesus, what can you do for me? And I just want to suggest to you that Jesus wants to be more than welcomed in our lives for what he can do. He wants us to be welcoming him in every facet of who we are. So is Jesus our buddy? You know, is he just our buddy? Is he just the guy that we call on when things get tough? I've had to... Um, just wrestle with this over the last week. I, I mean, I've had to wrestle with if, 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 if my calendar was exposed to everybody and it is exposed to God, would, would God say of me, Jason, listen, I appreciate you welcomed me to be a part of the worship night once a night. I, I'm glad that you welcomed me to be there. And I'm, I'm glad that you welcomed me to be there Sunday morning. And I'm glad that you welcomed me to be part of some decisions in your life. I'm just not sure he would say, as a matter of fact, I see you welcoming me to be every part of your life. I, I feel like I, I fail in that area. 
I, I feel like if I'm honest with myself, that there's many parts of my calendar of my life that I'm like, okay, God, I need you here, and I want you here, but sometimes it's hard to say, God, relationally, every part of my life I want you, and when I'm, and when I'm driving in a car, and when I'm sitting, and when I'm reading, like, is God everything? Is God all in all? Is God every part of me? Is God my fullness? Like, is he everything that I breathe, live, eat, drink? Is he everything in my life? Or is he just little compartments that fill up needed spaces? Like, is he welcomed, but not, am I not welcoming? And I'm going to conclude on just a couple thoughts. If you are married, maybe you can understand really well the difference between... <laughs> just going to something or somebody for something they need or want as opposed to having someone be a part of your whole life. Uh, you know, so if you're married, and if you're not, maybe you're single and you can understand, but what if your spouse only went to you when they needed something? Well, the person you're hoping to be your spouse, you're hoping to get married, you're like, what if they only come to you when they need, like, some money, or they need some food, or they need just affection, or they need intimacy, or whatever. Like, but they only come to you in moments of need, but the rest of their life, you're really not welcomed in. That wouldn't be a relationship at all. And my concern is that we sometimes treat God the same way. We love what he can do for us. I'm concerned that sometimes we don't love just who he is. As the worship band comes um, in a moment, I love the fact that Jesus indeed heals his son. I like how this guy responds, this person of no faith. Jesus says, hey, the people coming for signs and wonders, and the guy's like, I don't know. I just got a son that's going to die. Would you come, please? Like, right? You get it? Would you just come? Jesus says, you know what, your son is well, so go. Like, that's a faith statement for me. Your son is well, so just go. I, I, I realize that as I'm reading through this whole passage that um, a lot of our choices and how we live our lives are really faith statements. They're really... They're really our way of saying, okay, God, do I really trust God with my life? John 10, 10, Jesus came that we might have life in abundance, right? So faith says, okay, I really trust God that when he leads my life and when I follow him, that it be the best life possible. That's true faith. God, when, you, when I follow you, when I do what you call me to do, when I obey, I will do it because I know you have the best for me. Often... We don't really believe that God has the best for us, so we put God in that compartment, right, and say, okay, God, you have this, 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 but I'll take care of my own life because I don't really trust you, your decision, this part of my life. And I think this, 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 this ruler from King Herod kind of puts everything in perspective when he has a very simple faith in Jesus. And Jesus says, listen, I know you want me to come. I know you want me to touch your son, but I'm just telling you now, just go. He's healed. There's a simple faith in that. Amen. Here's the really funny part, ironic. I just think Jesus is so cool. <laughs> the Gospel of John doesn't say it, but the other Gospels do. Do you realize that Jesus goes to Capernaum anyway? Just think about that for a moment. Like this whole thing, it's a setup. This is awesome. Jesus goes to Galilee. 
He talks about a prophet not being welcome. He says, hey, but they welcomed him because they're welcome for what they could get. He goes to Cana on purpose just to meet with the guy from Capernaum. He tells the guy from Capernaum, your son is healed. Go there. Even though the guy said, please come with me, Jesus goes anyway. I, don't, I think that's awesome. Maybe you guys don't think it's as cool as I think, but I just think how Jesus works in our life is so way beyond our understanding. Jesus could have just went there. But we would have missed a great story about faithfulness and about welcoming versus being welcomed. Father, I thank you so much for each one that's here today. I thank you for uh, their lives. I thank you that you pursued each one of us, that each one of us, you chased us down, that each one of us, you love so much that you're not willing to leave us like we are, and I thank you for that. I thank you for your Holy Spirit and his grace and love convicts us because you want a relationship with us, because you want to hang out with us, because you want us to have life to the fullest. Thank you for that. Every head bowed, every eye closed. If you're here today, and by the way, we say that because I, I just want you to take a moment to allow the Holy Spirit to speak to you Sometimes when, when, you know, eyes are open, you can be looking around. I just, I'm asking the Holy Spirit to speak to you, so that's why we do it. So every head bowed, every eye closed. Um, first, if you're here today, like maybe you've been a quote-unquote Christian for years. Maybe you've been to church faithfully. Maybe you serve in dis- different capacities. But today, you know that Jesus is not the Lord of your life. You know that he's not number one. You know that you welcome him in certain parts of your life, but there's many parts that he's not welcomed in. And I just want to give an opportunity again for you to just recommit your life to Jesus, saying, God, man, I, I, every part of my life is yours. Every part. What I own, who I am, what I do, what I think about, what I read, what I see, who I talk to, how I talk to people, every part is yours. I want to encourage you in that. So if you're here today and, and you just want to recommit your life to Jesus, giving him every part, would you just slip a hand up real high and say, Lord, yes, I, I want to give you every part. <laughs> right now it's not, but I, I rededicate my life to you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. You're saying, God, I know it. It's not all yours, but I want it to be. Right now, in Jesus' name. Even the secret sins that no one knows about. The things that are hidden from you, God, I want you to be Lord of that area. In Jesus' name. Father, you see many of us crying out to you this morning, recognizing that we fall short. And so, Lord, I thank you. I thank you for loving us enough to convict us. Even right now, I believe you're convicting hearts and your love and your grace. And you're saying, come to me in that area. Give that area to me. Welcome me in that part of your life and I will make it into something beautiful. Even now, you're calling us by your Holy Spirit And Lord, we respond to you and we say, yes, I give you that area in every area of my life. Forgive us. Forgive us for the times that we have not let you in. Thank you for your faithfulness, Jesus, to take residence every part of our life. In Jesus' name. May God bless you all. I uh, I just pray for you this week that God will continue to draw you closer to him. That there be a greater passion and a greater desire for the things of God in your life. He has more in your life than you can ever possibly imagine. Do you believe that? I do. In Jesus' name. Hey, so... Um, just a couple maybe new instructions maybe. Here's how I think we'll go forward um, for at least the next few weeks anyway. Um, Instead of releasing from the back, I'm just going to say you're free to go. But if you have concern, maybe just remain where you are for a while. How's that? 
that way people that need to get out of here, they don't have to wait for all you slow people in the back to leave. <laughs> so if you have to go, that's fine. But just, you know, if you are concerned, just stay where you are. We won't lock the doors on you. You'll, you'll get to go, but maybe that'll help some of you get out of here as quick as you want to. Reminder, if you're helping out with um, sports camp, the meeting is like coming up right now in, uh, in that room. So God bless you guys. Is that it? All right, God bless you.